Hey everybody, CyberTow back with you. We're continuing our roundup of how to handle uh, hanging pawns properly. Today's uh, This example is going to be a bit more balanced. The examples of the D-pawn break that we've looked at before have been more explicitly all about the kingside attack. Um, this is a good example of a, a position where the D-pawn advance, it has some kingside attacking elements because by definition it cuts the board in half so it makes any kingside attack much easier but it has a lot more positional elements to it so it's a bit more balance of a example that will give us a chance to talk about a few other factors so this is a game of Tibor Florian against Jakob Estrin uh, this is a game of Hungary 1966 uh, Florian was white c4 e4 so this is the Mechanus attack um, this is very trendy nowadays, and white scores incredibly well with this. Uh, it is a fantastic way to get an aggressive position while avoiding the big theory. Um, when you look at like the Marshall attack and the Roy Lopez, or the Nidorf, or the Grunfeld, all of those openings have theory that extends, in some cases, up to the very end game around move 40. It's hard to call those openings aggressive because if all you're doing is memorizing theory and replaying at the board is that really aggression and some people might enjoy that part of chess i enjoy it a little bit but i personally enjoy much more the competitive aspect and the feeling of creating in the moment at the board um, so the mechanics has a lot of unexplored areas where you just get a game of chess at the board and testing whoever has the best memory for theory isn't really a factor. Uh, plus, at least there's some tr very truly aggressive positions. Um, I would definitely recommend it, especially if you're an English player. It really puts the lie to the idea that the English is a passive opening. If White's looking for a fight, in my opinion, the English has a lot more ways to get an aggressive, untheoretical fight than E4, certainly. Um, Esrin played D5. The other major option is C5, but this leads to pawn sacrifice for white that, in my opinion, is quite favorable. X. That'd be d5. So this is similar to the Sassanian, except white's up a couple of vital tempi. Um, this all works because d6 doesn't work here. Uh, d6 gets hit by c5. Um, if black takes... Queen takes... <sighs> About four, and White's already has more or less a decisive attack. This is going to be followed up by castling queenside, uh, knight c7. This game's already over. Um, if Black plays d5, push by four. Of course, the knight can't draw back to c6 because just knight c7 in that case. But an f6, queen h5 check, and White White has a decisive attack. We're threatening the rook in the corner. Knight c7 is threatened. So this all works because d6 is impossible, so black is forced to play a6. And there's quite a bit of theory extending from here. I don't want to turn this video into uh, a theoretical trees. Um, but white scores incredibly well from here. In my opinion, white has more than enough compensation. He has the bishop pair, which is almost always a, a boon. And in this, certain, in this position, it certainly is a boon. Plus, the dark squares for white are emaciated. Black only has one pawn on a dark square, and all of these dark squares around the queen side and the center are completely unprotected. White, white does it very well from this position, so d5 is more popular, in my opinion deservedly so. e5, d4, knight e4 is another line. One of my favorite moves, h4 here. This was a choice from uh, Topalov against, I think it was Rosenthalus in 1999. Uh, a good example of how modern chess has lost its uh, pretensions or obsessions with Tarashian-like statements about knights of the rim, you know, flank pawns. You know, we play the move that works. We don't play the move that conforms to a statement that rhymes. Um, so h4, a fun move, but d4 is the main line. Take. b takes the best move. Queen takes. Now to three, in my opinion, d4 is a slightly more accurate move order, but that's just a theoretical thing. Uh, C5. I think it's fair to say that this is just simply worse. Uh, this is one of the major options from this position, but in my opinion, just E5 here is, in my opinion, just the better move. Um, 
the main difference between C5 and E5, especially on C8, is certainly much happier about the move E5. Um, it activates Black's position a lot more effectively. It challenges for the center much more directly than C5. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's just fair to say C5 is the worst, because the special on C8 is so much the worst for this pawn not having advanced. Uh, G3, not necessarily better than the main line, but it's interesting. Uh, obviously, this bishop's going to be very strong on this long diagonal, um, along with this open file. Uh, the main line is just D4. H6 is pretty much necessary. Um, if he doesn't play, this is the main line of this position. And white's much better. Uh, Bishop d3 is going to win even more time against an exposed black queen, so h6 is fairly necessary. And king f1, and this was featured in a game between Ser uh, Ser1 and Korchnoi, uh, among other games. I like this move. Uh, when you have hanging pawns, you really don't want to be trading off pieces, especially bishops, because the bishop pair really enhances uh, hanging pawns. So white is willing to forfeit his rights of castling. Um, to keep those bishops in place. So here, white keeps material on the board. His follow-up moves are just going to be bishop b2, and then threatening to ex uh, hit a discovery on the exposed black queen. Notice that if black tries to win a pawn, this is more or less poisoned. And white's getting the pawn back on g7, and then both kings are exposed, white has the bishop pair, white has a huge edge in development, that's a decisive advantage for white. Um, but otherwise, this is a, prom a promising position for white. Uh, the fact that he's lost the right to castle doesn't really factor into the position, in my opinion. Uh, but g3, very interesting. Um, it's not what I would play, because it's not really why white plays the Mechanus. Uh, but this leads to hanging pawns that have a much more positional flavor, because this bishop isn't won't be on that aggressive b1 to h7 diagonal. It's going to be a lot more about the d4, d5 pawn break. And that pawn break will have a lot more positional elements to it. So that, that shift of the piece from one diagonal to the long diagonal changes the character of the position completely. It's part of the fascination of chess. Castle... E4, CX, D4. This is a mistake. As always, when you're defending against hanging pawns, you'd like to keep the position as closed up as possible, even when things are slightly more positional than otherwise. Um, E5 is simply better. This is sort of in the vein of the uh, Hubner Nimzo Indian um, attacking white's pawn weaknesses and trying to keep the position closed up. Uh, Bishop G5. Notice that D5 is a dire positional error. This is a, a very favorable hanging pawn for uh, black, just because the position's completely closed up. This d pawn is securely blockaded, so it's not really a strength. And this pawn on c4 is just flat, a flat out weakness. Uh, one potential line. Um, the engine gives us this completely equal. I would slightly prefer black, just because it's the sort of position that you're hunting for uh, when you play against the hanging pawn. They're completely immobilized. This pawn on c4 is absolutely a weakness. Uh, neither of the bishops really impressed, so the bishop pair really isn't an asset here just yet. Uh, very nice position for black. But taken on d4, uh, I mean, bishop g5 is the best. I'll just show quickly this sort of position. This would still be comfortable uh, for white. Uh, this is very much in the vein of the Catalan. Both these bishops are aimed quite beautifully at the black queen side. Um, but taking a d4 opens things up way too much. H6. Eight. Queen e2. Um, I'll go back to b2. This is a good time to take stock of the position, uh, in my opinion. Again, the fact that this bishop is on g2 instead of d3 really changes the entire character of the position. Um, we're not going to be seeing a crazy kingside attack against the Black King. This is going to be a much more positional exercise. Uh, the bishop on g2 is quite strong. You know, it's aiming right at the Black Queen side. So this b7 pawn might end up being the decisive factor in terms of an attacking point, especially combined with this open b file. Um, but the d D4, D5 push is very desirable, but it's going to have a lot more positional elements. It'll open up this bishop on B2, uh, but it'll be mostly about achieving a very strong pass pawn on uh, D5. 
Uh, and then sort of trying to push that up the board and break the blockade of that. So rook d8. Queen e2, not, not the best. Queen b3 does the same thing, except the b file is a strong avenue of attack for white. That would be much better. Queen e, it's not a dis it doesn't sh this a misstep doesn't change the character of the position though. Queen e7, rook a d1. Queen c7, bishop d7. When you have a bad piece like this, finding a way to profitably employ it is often the key to the position. Here, black needs to find a way to get this bishop into the game. Even if it's just tucking away on e8 out of the way to connect the rooks. Uh, queen c7 just leaves that bad piece in place. Uh, rook c1, trying to keep vis-a-vis -vis with the black queen in case of d5. Knight d2 is another option. It unmasks the strong bishop in g2 and finds a better place for the white knight. And this is a substantial advantage for white. Uh, rook c1 isn't better or worse, it's just a different way of playing. Um, this is a much more open-ended position than some of the other hanging pawns that we've looked at. Um, there's not so many tactical variations at this point, it's much more positional exercise, so there's less variations because there's so many other different ways of playing this position. It's more open-ended. And here, d5. So, everything is perfectly arranged for the d5 break. You know, the rooks are behind the pawns, uh, the bishop on g2 helps support it, but again, it's more of a positional exercise than the other pawn breaks that we've looked at. Uh, there's no crazy kingside attack coming out of this pawn break. It's more gaining space, gaining a strong pass d-pawn, and black's going to do his best to try to keep this d-pawn securely blockaded and try to get the rest of his pieces mobilized. Knight d5. Knight d4. is a little bit stronger, um, but this is also quite strong. Again, this is a more open-ended position. This is a much more positional exercise. Uh, there's not many tactical variations here, because it's a much calmer position. Uh, a6 is a mistake. Black needs to resolve some of the tension here. Queen b6. Notice uh, Queen c3. Notice that taking would be worse. Um, this would develop this rook in a8 for free and give black some counterplay. And then bishop g4. Again, black needs to resolve this bishop somehow. This is a better defensive chance for black. Um, black is still much worse, but a6, again, it doesn't, it's not mobilizing anything about black's position. Black really needs to get the rest of his pieces out. Queen b4, e8, knight x e6, this is fancy, but it's unnecessary. Um, knight f5, it's the same tactical idea, but just an improved version, because it doesn't give black a chance to Get this bad bishop off the board. B6. The point is, after EX, D6. This black queen has nowhere to go except D7. Queen B6. And then just queen A7. And just slide into that square. That rook is dropping off the board. It's dropping off the board because black never resolved the slight squared bishop. That's sort of the mistake that's going to haunt black in this position. Uh, the other line, b6, but this is a well and truly crushing c-pawn for white. This is the best piece on the board. Um, I mean, more or less, white's up a queen because of this pawn, because this black queen has to stay on c7 if anybody said it. Uh, so 96, x6, white is still winning, but it doesn't necessarily, it, it gives black more chances. Bishop x6. <laughs> d6, notice if white takes. White's still much better, but it, white's definitely lost a lot of control in this position. Uh, c8, queen xa5. So white is up a pawn here, but now this pawn on d6, it's a little bit, it's harder to force through, but white's certainly in control here. c5. Queen f4, this is still drifting. Uh, notice that white can't take on c5. Uh, white's actually just going to lose a pawn straight back, either to rook b6, or to rook b2, or to rook b4. Suddenly white has all these pawn weaknesses, and they're impossible to hold. Uh, best move would just be queen d4. One line that I give. And 
And this this D pawn is certainly a strength. I mean, this is, this is the bone in Black's throat. And White can just continue with Bishop B5, Rook BC1, Rook C7. Um, this is definitely a winning position for White. Uh, but Queen F4, it continues to drift. Rook D7 blockades. He's going to uh, double on the D file and try to win this pawn. G5, a complete mistake. So this shreds Black's kingside stability. There's no reason to do this. B5 is slightly paradoxical because the C pawn looks like a weakness, but the idea is that it gives Black possession of the C file for counterplay and allows Black to aim at this A pawn for counterplay. And now G5 is fine because White doesn't have D2 to drop his queen back to. So on Queen F6... Black simply takes the d-pawn. So, queen d4. And black is actually holding here. Uh, if the bishops get traded off, that's probably just a drawn rook ending, because the pawn extra isn't enough to win. Uh, but black has counterplay here. White, black has counterplay against this a weak a-pawn. Uh, and black is white is still going to be tied down to defending his d-pawn. Um, if the pawn advances to d7, black will always have king f8 and king e7 to help blockade it. Uh, Black should be holding this. Uh, but g5 is a decisive mistake, because uh, white has queen d2 here. Because the queens are staying on the board, this g5 is just a, a decisive weakness in the black king side. Push back c4. This is a slight mistake. b5 would still be better. One example that I give. Um, white, is, white is still on the verge of winning this. Uh, but bishop back c4 should lose directly. H4, th this is a mistake. White has a direct winning line here. Bishop d5. This wins tactically. H4, notice that rook xd6 gets met with bishop xf7. Bishop takes. And then the cute little line of rook e1. Um, cuts the black king off. Now, queen h8 made is threatened. Black has no good response to this. Uh, H4, missed opportunity. Bishop b6. Hx g5. So this is the final error. Queen xg5. This continues the game. E even though black is still certainly much worse here. Black can sort of dance around and try to get the white to commit to this queen trade, but white is doesn't have to do this, except on his own terms. And black is worse, but material is even. Uh, black has the counterplay of pushing his queenside pawns forward. Uh, and with only one t a color of bishop on the board, it's impossible to break the blockade on d8 of this pawn. Uh, if white ever pushes to d7, black will just play king f8, king e7. Um, it's hard to make progress in this position, whereas hxg5, again, it's a weakness of the king side, and it's keeping queens on the board. Uh, that's the nightmare scenario for black. Uh, bishop d5, bishop c6 is the most accurate, but this also wins. This blocks the guardianship of g5. Queen takes. Rook h4. This is the only move in this position, actually, uh, but it is sufficient. So rook h8 is threatened. Queen c3, that stops the rook, and then white just blocks off the long diagonal again. So rook h8 mate, uh, that threat is recreated. King g2. The rook is hanging, but again, black doesn't have time to take because of rook h8 mate. Rook e5, so just recreating that threat once again, blocking up the long diagonal. And black resigned here. Um, there, there is no answer to rook h8 mates. So black gives up the ghost here. Um, really, the key to the position that I want you to look at is much earlier here. So this this is much more of a, a positional flavor of hanging pawns because this bishop is on g2. This is Similar to some hanging pawn positions that you get from the ready. Uh, but the theme of d4, d5 remains. Uh, again, that's the pawn break you want to always be on the lookout for. It changes character here because the pieces are have a slightly different optimization here. So because the bishop is on g2, the pawn break d4, d5, it won't have the same kingside attacking impact. But because the bishop's supporting that pawn on d5, it's much more likely that white will just have a strong pass pawn on d5. Um, but again, that pawn break of d4, d5 is exactly what you want to be look on the lookout for all the time. Whether it's to achieve some sort of attacking structure, 
or to just achieve a strong pass pawn on d5. And it doesn't have to be either or. We can see later in the game, once white achieves that d5 push, the fact that this d-pawn cuts the board in half is what allows white to profitably achieve a decisive attack on the king side. Because black's pieces are tied down, blockading this d-pawn, that's what allows white the time to break through on the king side. So it's not necessarily either or, but achieving that d4, d5 break, whether it's to achieve a kingside attack or to just gain space and gain a strong pass d-pawn, that's exactly what white wants to be on the lookout for at all times. So that is the thematic move of the position when you have hanging pawns. The window dressing will change, and the reasons why you want to achieve it will change. But that is the move to be on the lookout for. So uh, excellent game from Florian. Uh, we'll round, we'll run, round up a review of how to fight with hanging pawns tomorrow with one last example, and then we'll get into how to fight against hanging pawns and a review of those concepts. So, my name is John. I'll see you then.